Alhamdulillah, he was a member of Aligarh Senate also. He is very well known in India, he is an educationist and uh, I am going to give the mic to him. So he is going to talk about the current situation in India and maybe he will touch a little bit on the uh, recent uh, violence that happened in Delhi area. Uh, and later on, inshallah, we will have some time for you guys to question and answer session if you want to ask him anything on the current affairs, on the community things, what is going on. So he will give his insight, inshallah. Uh, Jazakallah khair for coming, uh, whoever is here, and to people who are listening. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for this honor. Uh, one thing Mother Saab has missed, I am his student from age four. I sat on his lap and learned the tricks of this trade. <laughs> As uh, all of us are aware, the whole community is going through a phase of tremendous challenges and testing times. And Alhamdulillah, the teachings of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam makes us strong to face any challenges which come. And whatever difficulties are there, we know uh, because of our Hama. For that, we have to pray to Allah and seek His refuge. And ensure that each one of us, as individuals, stand up to the expectations of what the Quran teaches and the ahadith of Huzur Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm sure most of you who are here are in the process and most of you are mature enough to have gone through different challenges and have come up to this stage in your life where we back home look at you as role models for our children. Because you have crossed seven seas, worked in environment which was totally alien when you came here. Not only have gone through the process of understanding this culture, assimilating the local culture, but also have created a place of your own and most importantly you have not forgotten the base for that we not only appreciate but thank each one of you for being us being with us always and especially in times of crisis thank you very much i have come here today in these difficult times to share with you what we are presently facing. Undoubtedly, these are difficult times, which needs not only a proper plan, strategy, and a clear roadmap, and build up character with dedication and sincerity to not only overcome this, but also succeed in all these efforts and once again establish our leadership back home 
so that we give to our selves and the generations to come a system of peace prosperity and a message to the others that we will not take anything lying down last 6 years the moment the india government has taken charge we are living in a stage of fear frustration and total confusion what all was promised in the manifesto of the present ruling party nothing has come true neither they want to discuss in spite of that failure the indian population reelected them with better numbers that further encouraged them to do what they are doing now last 6 months what we have seen is utter confusion they do not know they do not want to discuss and they do not want to justify their actions india is the first country where a contract between two humans a civil contract has been criminalized the triple talaq nowhere in the history of mankind this type of criminalization of a civil contract has happened they got encouraged the next step was the wrong pending judgment regarding babri masjid issue out of the 1100 and odd pages of judgment more than 1000 pages point by point has successfully admitted that the masjid existed it was constructed properly and the last few pages were clearly inserted i'm sure without the knowledge of the wise judges we kept quiet because our leaders the muslim personal law board which was leading that campaign tried to convince us that we will obey and abide by the supreme court judgment no doubt we absorbed that insult but the whole community was shattered felt insulted and was not in a position to understand what our leadership was doing next came abrogation of article 370 regarding kashmir and section 35a under that where there was a total clamp down of the valley and it continues even today incidentally article 371 that proceeds 370 is similar in nature but pertaining to the north east and nobody has raised any objection to that and that is being followed in letter and spirit because the people are of a different faith then came assam issue of national register of citizenship which the supreme court ordered and july 31st 4 million people were identified not having proper documentation to prove their citizenship this was a big jolt to the ruling party their expectations were quite contrary to the facts which were revealed by that exercise they gave affidavit to supreme court that we are in a position where this draft has to be revised and then after a month they came with another finding that 1.9 million 
are doubtful citizens and they do not have proper documentation. Once again, they thought that most of them will be of Muslim faith, but they found that more than 1.5 million were non-Muslims. Bengal elections are due the next year. Their main target was how to appease the Bengali speaking people and give them the mandate so that they will get the majority in the coming election. So they came up with the amendment of the Citizenship Act 1955, which was amended in 2003. And the 2019 amendment, the bill said persecuted minorities and Hindus from four countries. But the act has no mention of this persecution part. This is another fallacy of that. Anyhow, the act was passed. No doubt many non-NDA parties objected. Few of the partners also objected, but they had the majority in both the houses and they can get it through. And the puppet president had to just sign on the dotted lines once it went for went to him for passing the desert. <coughs> this <coughs> act, while it was being discussed in the parliament, the Honorable Home Minister very clearly explained the chronology of events which is going to happen. He said, the NRC no doubt was done for Assam, but now we are planning to do it all over the country. He said the NRC will come, then the population register will be established, and then the CAA will come. This was the catch, which fortunately few of the leaders could, could understand it, and immediately they reacted. That led to protest all over. No doubt the CAA is meant to give citizenship, not to remove the existing citizens from the list. That was the logic which they promoted. But they did not answer that those who are not satisfying the NRC and not having the documentation to prove the citizenship, how are you going to treat them? Even today, in spite of so much protest, debates and discussions, the Home Minister, neither the Prime Minister has clarified this. When this was raised in the Parliament, they gave an ambiguous statement that for NRC, for the nation, we have not yet decided. There was no commitment what they are going to decide, when they are going to decide. In this confusion, the Shaheen Bagh protest, the Jami Milia protest, all that has happened, all of you, you are aware of it. The most important thing behind this is, the Delhi elections were announced at that time, and they were expecting to exploit this situation and divide the population as is their habit, Incidentally, the majority population of Delhi is not pro-Muslim, that you have to clearly understand. Know very well that the local politics are different from national politics and the local requirements are totally different from the national governments and they selectively decided to go for the Aam Army Party and the Muslims, as is our herd mentality, went after that war and overwhelmingly supported that party for the numbers which we see now. And what the present Delhi government has done for the <coughs> during the protest and after the riots, it is all of the, everybody could understand that. Now what they are doing is definitely trying to heal those wounds, but what was exactly needed and required for them to do to prevent that didn't happen. 
let that writing happen, happen for nearly three to five days without any intervention from the higher officials or the politicians or the local leadership. This was a mistake made by the Muslim community to elect this group. The next thing which happened during the riots was the whole community was rudderless. There was no leadership to either support or take them forward. Whatever retaliation happened was in self-defense and wherever they could succeed in defending themselves, least damage happened to the community, both in life and property. Areas where they were not in a position to defend was the most affected, both in terms of property as well as life. This gives us a very clear indicator what is to be done for the future. When we discuss about the plan and roadmap, we will discuss this for you. Coming back to the writing, this was not the work of the locals. In fact, we were very grateful to the local majority community for helping the Muslims who were living in minority in those areas. They not only protected them, their properties, as well as the religious places. Few of them stood guard in front of Masajid to protect. Similarly, the Muslim community also did reciprocate it. Not even a single mandir was touched when there were more than 30 of them in that area. And 19 Masajid were either partly or fully destroyed, including burning of religious texts and spoiling the whole environment. This I personally cannot call it communal riot because there was no enmity between the two communities living in that area. Neither the locals participated in the rioting. It was the handiwork of trained goons. Naturally, we will blame RSS for that because that is their ideology, that is what they are training their cater for. And with due police protection, and active canines, this was done. All of us have seen through different social media clips. The main electronic media, the print media failed us again. It was the social media which stood up to this task and whatever facts we could get is through that medium. This gives us another lesson, how to get the reality, how to get the facts and how to filter the fake news and propaganda. During that 10 days, I did not watch a single television channel. I was only following the social media. Incidentally, I, before coming here, I visited Delhi, met the Deputy Chief Minister and accompanied him, went to the camp along with the Delhi workboard people and the Minister, Mr. Gopal Rai, is in charge of this Delhi work. The victims who were living in the camps are totally shattered. Psychologically, they are a depressed lot. The children are fearing to go back to their homes. We requested the work board in charge to get psychiatrists to give counseling. In medicine, as few of you know, there is a syndrome called post-traumatic syndrome that happens not only to the victims but also to the volunteers who go and see these victims. They are also equally disturbed and psychology they get disturbed unless a proper professional counseling is done. Sometimes medication also is needed. This cannot be corrected. So 10 non-Muslim popular psychiatrists in Delhi volunteered to come and help these victims and their volunteers. What I'm trying to impress upon you is the general population, even today, is very neutral, fair, and friendly with each other. It is the outside elements who have been trained, prepared, 
and imported into these areas to create this crisis and rioting. One very good thing happened when these people were trying to defend. They identified these rioters who had come from outside and whatever casualties happened from that side mostly are these outside rioters. That has given another lesson to the rioters that they have to be very careful next time. Unfortunately, it is the innocent Muslim elderly men and women and few children, infants, who have been killed by these barbarians. barbarians. The mortuary at two hospitals, GTV hospital and another hospital, tells tales of the barbaric attacks done by them. What the social media has shown is very little of the facts which happened there. We have now moved forward. Whatever relief was needed has been done. The whole community, the society stood up and came to the help of the victims. Now a proper plan to rehabilitate them in a systematic, professional way, identifying genuine victims and building up their lives and their businesses in a far better way than what they were living has to be done. So that the perpetrators have to know for sure that their acts are going, not going to give them the results which they have done. Number two, for the victims, they should gain the confidence that they have brothers and sisters all over who will stand behind them. God forbid if such thing happens. Inshallah, it will never happen there again. Because wherever they have defended themselves, they have given very fitting replies. The government now has definitely woken up and trying to give financial support and necessary security, especially the Delhi government. The central government still has not woken up to what is neither they discussed this in the parliament. When the question hour this was raised, the government, the Home Minister refused to answer to that. Two days ago in the parliament on the floor of Rajya Sabha, he told Mr. Ghulam Nabi Azad that he'll give him priority time in the next two, three days. You can understand for a fellow parliamentarian, his priority is after two, three days to discuss about the bill and the after effects of the protest which is happening. I don't know what the discussion will be and what will be the outcome of that. Anyhow, coming back to the rehab package which the government of Delhi has decided and the Delhi Wagboard Relief Committee has been given the responsibility to rebuild the mosque and they have already passed a resolution that all the masajid will be rebuilt by them from their own funds. Those who want to further contribute for that, they have to contact the work board. Inshallah, that will be taken care of. Those who are doing it on their own, I think it's a sheer waste of time. When a government agency has decided and they have identified a construction company to take up their job, it will not be necessary for us to waste our resources in duplicating that. Instead, there are so many other things which have to be done like what SEED has already been doing for educational and economic empowerment. The most important point was the most of the victims from the community were illiterate, daily wage earners and child labor or small entrepreneurs. We have to rebuild their businesses, we have to reconstruct their houses and gain their confidence that we are always there, inshallah, to help, assist and give them the necessary security. This is the medium term plan and the long term plan is definitely education is the only solution. The children who are affected need to be identified and each one of them have to be picked up and proper education facility has to be provided to them. Till they complete 
and enter into a career. It can be vocational education, it can be professional education, or they need to be made self-sufficient in terms of establishing some businesses for them. My humble submission to this enlightened group is identify the genuine needed victims and have a proper monitoring mechanisms to ensure that your amanat is not wasted. As far as the immediate relief is concerned, everything possible has been done. As far as the rehab is concerned, process has started. What you need to do is understand the long-term needs and give a solution to them. And since we are working in the educational field, we can only suggest to provide them the best of the education and ensure that they complete that education. For the sake of money or guidance, they should not discontinue or drop out. As far as the widows are concerned, they need to be supported fully financially so that they do not discontinue their children's education for lack of finances. These are the two things which I want to humbly submit before you because the mandate of SEED is educational and economic empowerment. Thank you very much for your time. I have made my presentation precise so that we move on to the practical aspect of giving solutions to this problem. Thank you. Uh, you, you have heard Dr. Fakhruddin Mohammed, a brief description of the conditions in India and about the violence that happened in Eastern Delhi. Uh, relief work is going on, it's been taken care of uh, Delhi state government. They are giving uh, compensation to the casualties, uh, helping the people whose houses are burned as well as uh, the work board will be, you know, you heard that they will be fixing the massages. SEED as an organization is not in relief business. We don't do that. And we had many inquiries. Uh, people called us and we said, give the money to organizations that are in relief. Because that's not what we do. But we do help uh, education-wise and helping the widows and destitute families under that objective, we are planning to support financially the widows of this crime that happened. And we will help, inshallah, the children of those widows and any other children who are going to school education-wise. So that's where we are uh, heading and we want to uh, request all of you to support this cause. The report I gave you is from the Human Welfare Service Trust of Delhi. It's a very comprehensive report. It just gives you an idea what happened and what is required. The financial loss is in crores of rupees, very big. What we can do is a, a long-term aid to the victims, and inshallah, that will go long ways. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah. <coughs> So inshallah, we'll, Jazakallah Khair uh, Fakhuddin sir for enlightening us with the uh, actual reality on the ground and and uh, helping us understand the situation and how we can help those victims. Inshallah, we'll uh, uh, see we'll partner with these local organizations and whatever the way we can help them, inshallah, we'll help them. So now we can uh, open the floor for questions. Uh, I'm sure some of you have questions about the situation in India and about uh, how to help the Muslims in India. So if anyone has any questions, please go ahead. Uh, ask questions, but uh, don't get into political things, because SEED is not a political organization. You can ask questions. You understand my request, inshallah. Uh, OK? Uh, yes. uh, my name is Asim Khan. I'm also from Hindi. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Asim Khan. I'm also from Hyderabad. After uh, the uh, I work with the Wali Alam Sabi here in Alabama. I don't know if you know him. 
Human Welfare Trust is the Jamaat Islami Mail, right? So, well, yeah, that was our local contract here. Anyway, apart from that, my question basically is uh, uh, we are having a lack of leadership. Uh, uh, not political, I'm not trying to get it, Paul Magar. That has a big bearing on, on what all is going on. And how far can we just be on the receiving end? And, and we know the police is uh, also helping these outsiders, like you said, people, 2,000 people, we got news like they came from outside the state somewhere, and then on the day it was all pre-planned, it was basically announced a day, like if you don't take care of this, we'll take care of this, right? We all heard those clips on the social media. So my biggest uh, heartburn is how, I mean, we, we, are, we feel helpless. We, even from here, we feel like, I don't know how long we can take it as human beings and as Muslims. We, we know we are, as an Ummah, we are lacking in a lot of areas. But 200 million Muslims cannot be just slaughtered, right? So what can we do and what can be done? I, I don't know the answer. I'm, I, I'm, I'm looking to you for help because you know the ground realities more than me sitting here. But everyone gets emotional. And what I'm trying to ask is, is there a chance to either defend ourselves? I'm not even going to talk about offense yet. Uh, thank you, Asim sir. You raised a very pertinent uh, issue. Permit me to take two minutes to go back to the genesis of this lack of leadership. Till recently, we have been following our religious leadership and we have seen what they have done to us. We have seen the politicians. I give them benefit of doubt because they come with vested interest and they invest a lot of their resources to gain the position what they have. We have seen the pseudo political leadership who wake up only at the time of elections to gather or to earn their corn of flesh and disappear after the elections. We have also seen pseudo-religious leaders who try to incite us for their own gains and ultimately the community gets misled. The time has come for us to identify alternates. Among the alternates, I feel that those who are working in the field of education empowerment they have to be identified, they have to be nurtured, motivate them and promote them because they have already proved their leadership capabilities in their own field. They are not interested in politics that's, or the community leadership but most important leadership duty they have done is to empower the community in the education. So we have to identify them and nurture them. Number two, because of this political vested interest, our social activists were never encouraged to lead the community. As soon as they became popular, the political leadership of that time has tried to defame them and discourage them so that they do not have any competition. So we have to identify these two groups, give them a chance because the politicians have failed us, they will never come up to your requirement. The religious leaders have totally failed us. So now let us identify people who are working in the field of education and the social activists who at their own cost of life and uh, dignity have been leading, asking for rights. So let us identify from among these two groups people who can take up this challenge and give them the necessary support both in terms of resources and necessary character building. I feel you, we have an answer there. This needs a proper plan. This needs taking them into confidence. The moment you talk to them, the first thing is, they'll say we are not interested in politics. We do know that. But for our community's need, we need them. So try to identify them first stage, then 
try to find what they need to come out of their shell and necessary facilities to be provided to them to lead the community. Number two, for long term, each one of us in our own family itself and in our enterprise, business, we look only at our children to succeed without preparing them. So let us work on individual families and train our next generation to have proper leadership qualities. That is another way of doing things. Unless you do that, there will not be a proper passing of the baton. This is very much needed. If you study the working pattern of the big industries of our country, you will see that the moment they graduate, they are sent to different internationally renowned business schools and they prepare them to take over. Once they come back, they are not given the MD or CEO position. They have to start from the floor. After some time, they realize that these children are going to Europe and America and not coming back, getting absorbed in this culture, thereby they were losing them. So, 40 big industrial houses in India and 10 business schools of the world of renown came together and established Indian School of Business in Hyderabad. I was instrumental in getting it to Hyderabad. The main concept was to get the faculty to India and retain these children in the Indian culture and expose them to the best of the faculty from the best of the institutions around the world. That has paid dividends. Last 20 years, 90, uh, 2001, the school was established. Now it's entered the 20th year. Not even a single child from the big industrial houses was lost to them. This is another way of handling our leadership issue. You need to invest. It cannot happen just by discussing. You have to have a proper plan. Study the current systems. Try to emulate the best business practices existing and give them the best facility. You want the best of the thing without investing on it. It is not possible. Hard work, sacrifice and dedication are necessary tools to achieve your objectives. Sure. I hope I yeah. answered your question. I want to make a comment here. Uh, we don't have leadership. When we have leadership, they are not for us, for the common community people. New leaders are emerging now. In this movement, a protest movement, new leaders have come up, young people. Amen. Uh, may Allah give them courage and uh, they should be our leaders. Religious leadership is now useful. They, for the last 50 years, they have not given us any solutions. All they said is pray and pray. Praying is okay. You need to make the world seek forgiveness, fine. But you need to be practically ready. The long-term answer is education. We don't have Muslims in higher education. This Indian Institute of Management, whatever, you don't find Muslims. In MIT and IIT, top education centers. We try to give scholarships with seed. We cannot find candidates to give a scholarship for higher education. This is the sad part. Unless we bring people from school system and then college and bring them at a very good level, we cannot send them to higher education. So this is what SEED's objective is, to get from beginning to have people ready to go to higher education. We, may, we don't even have 1% uh, representation in higher, higher education. So inshallah, we'll get there. Any questions? Other one? Anybody? Yeah. 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 My name is uh, Safiullah Muhammad. I'm talking more about the support side. Uh, as we all know that the government and the cops, everyone is an equal accomplice in destroying. And it's, it's totally one-sided. We all know that. Now, uh, there's so much that SEED can do, but how do we uh, socialize uh, these oppression with international uh, charity organizations. 
there's, there's a two-prong uh, thing in here. First thing is, one, we make sure that we enlighten them about the oppression going on. And then second is drawing their support out. That way, you know, uh, we are covering. Because once we learn how much damage that has been caused, especially to all the Muslims in, uh, in Delhi, I think uh, it's equally important that, you know, uh, we have to come together, utilize all our resources, our reach, uh, individually as in, you know, the community, and try to work with others. How do we socialize this entire uh, idea and get and seek support from international organizations because I know it's not a you know a thing of one or two uh, seed or any other organizations but work locally with you know uh, the communities out there who really were uh, deprived of all the you know benefits that the government can do because there's a lot of things government can do but you we all know that they are, don't want to come out in front in fact the fact that they are uh, delaying everything is is a you know a direct you know uh, involvement of them, which is assured. So I just want to make sure that how do we uh, utilize the resources and work with other international organizations who are in the same line of charity for you know people who are oppressed? Because uh, I think you know only the Muslim organizations at the point are working with them. So. How do we take global support, uh, especially in these day and age when social media is uh, used as an effective tool for that cause? Thank you very much. This is a very challenging question to answer at this stage. Uh, what we have achieved is uh, to make the international community aware of the operation happening. That we have succeeded in that aspect at this stage. Getting empathy from them, yes, definitely is important, but we are nowhere close to that because there are so many factors and elements working against us and uh, international charities have their own objectives. We have to gain their confidence, have regular confidence building meetings and exercises with them so that we don't talk to them only in times of crisis. We are part of that. Islam teaches us regarding socializing irrespective of the religious denomination. How far we have achieved that, let us introspect. Unless you do that, you cannot gain confidence of these international agencies. What is our contribution to Red Cross or any international charity which exists in this country? Let us understand that. Then we will be in a position to talk to them, to be part of this exercise anytime it happens. This is my feeling. I may be wrong. Most important, as far as sensitizing the international community about the operation and the barbarism which is happening is the majority community and the other non-Muslim media personnel, the journalists have played a major role. Tremendous response has come from them and their word carries a lot of meaning and they are highly respected in the international community. They were in a position to bring facts and they were very lucid in their presentation and their presentation was also very persistent and to the point. I know at least a dozen of them who have been working day and night through different uh, social media groups. Here, I take up this one. Here I like to submit before you that we have to make positive, concrete efforts to train our own journalists and mass communication specialists. Presently, there are half a dozen institutions in the country who are working for our community. At Chennai, we have Kaidya Millet Institute of Journalism and Mass Communication run by Mr. Dawood Mia, grandson of Kaidya Millet 
Ismail said. He has tied up with Hindu group. N. Ram, chairman of Hindu, is the chairman of this institution. And he has also tied up with the Asian Institute of Journalism being run by the Hindu group to provide teacher training in exchange of faculty. Similarly, for the Urdu medium students, Maulana Azad National Urdu University has a graduate program and a postgraduate program. In Jami Milia Islamia was the first institute in this country to have a full-fledged department of mass communication and journalism. So students, meritorious students are joining these institutes who need financial support and proper placement for internship with senior journalists will have to take a step forward to provide them the necessary scholarships. Scholarships need not always be financial help. It can be through proper counseling, it can be through your own contacts, and it can also be identifying good mentors to these budding students. Seed in this uh, area, uh, we are given scholarships to lawyer, law graduates, and journalists. Uh, you see these two photos, these two young sisters have completed master's degree in mass communication and journalism. We have made an agreement with twocircle.net and we have given them an apprentice program for one year training. They will be working under a senior journalist for one year, learn the ropes of the trade, whatever they will. We have given them uh, $5,000 stipend and uh, that's $10,000 for two. Uh, we started this program last year. It took them like seven, eight months to select the candidates. So inshallah we will increase this as this is our first trial. Other than that we have given about 12 to 13 scholarships and a master's degree for mass communication and journalism in, uh, in Delhi area and in Hyderabad also. And, and law graduates also we are emphasizing because if you go around and look for Muslim lawyers, you don't find them. So in Delhi, there are like 15 uh, scholarships and in Hyderabad, we have given five for a master's degree in law this year. Alhamdulillah. Any other question? Please ask question, don't make a speech. We have short time, I'm very sorry to say this, but <laughs> <laughs> alaikum. Uh, my name is Akbar Muhammad. I'm an interventional cardiologist in Springfield, Ohio, originally from Hyderabad. Uh, people are talking about MIT. Alhamdulillah, I'm a graduate of Harvard. Um, so Muslim Ummah has not like seen this happening for the first time. We have gone through crusades. We have gone through inquisition. We have gone through Mongolian um, atrocities on our Ummah. So what has happened? How did our community turn around? So we have to actually ponder on that. I have a few simple questions to ask or suggestions to make. Number one, there is no doubt that each individual household in India has to learn self-defense techniques. How we are going to achieve that? I'm going to leave it to the leadership in India because I'm sure there are people who are going to stop that from happening. Number two, how many of our Indian population or children are in IPS, IAS? If we have people in army, if people are in police, our own people can protect our own uh, community. Then we also have to make bridges for people from other communities who are actually fair-minded. I mean, there are lots of people, lots of organizations from Hindu side who are actually speaking for Muslim community. I can give a few names. Apurvanan Jha is there, Ram Bunyani is there. So there are certain organizations also, uh, I, I believe it's better not to take the names, I agree. Then uh, the people who are living here in foreign or Western countries, what can we do? 
we need to create interfaith activities we need to make friendship with the other communities we need to create bridges with the leadership we need to know who is our congressman or woman we need to know who is our uh, senator we need to uh, make it such a point that whenever something like this happens when kashmir happened in india they should know what is happening there they should actually make it clear in the uh, congress that this is not right they they should actually vote for a proper way of handling the situation there should be an international pressure on indian government so we can work that way ourselves too so maybe some of the suggestions you can elaborate Dr. Akbar mentioned about self-defense. This doesn't need any debate. It has to be done. It has to be done. Proper systems have to be created to make it a reality. Number two was representation of the community in different services. and law enforcing agencies is yes, not only in this field but almost all field we have identified nearly 300 higher education institutions in the country which have international recognition all of you are aware of indian institute of engineering and technology iits there are 23 of them now you have heard of all india institute of medical sciences there are 13 of them now you have heard of indian institute of management there are 15 of them now so the opportunities are increasing every day what is needed to be done is to bring awareness among our meritorious students in our culture a child and the parents want the child to study at the nearest possible institution irrespective of its national ranking if possible they want the children to st stay at home and learn especially the girl child when she is capable of getting admission and pursuing a career in the top institute of the country they don't want to send the children this is a totally a massive loss not only to the child but also to the community because the products of these institutions grow and qualify to be in the policy making of the country by depriving them to study in this institution you have taken a conscious decision not to be a part of the policy making of this country which all of us are seeing today which dr akbar pointed out the lack of it so my humble submission is we have identified the institutions presently less than 1% representation we have but without any effort from our side we can make it 5% by just creating awareness and doing counseling both with the parents and the students last year one mbbs student from kadappa daughter of a butcher kurish family we gave her proper counseling and got her admitted in monana azad medical college in delhi and we are supporting him every year with a meager amount of 1 lakh which include all fees including hostel similarly in postgraduation one mr ashraf whose mother is a vegetable sorry grandmother is a vegetable vegetable vendor and father works as a clerk in a weighing scale heavy vehicle weighing being skill shop we got him admitted again in moran azar institution and we are paying 1 lakh rupees that is taking care of all his expenses we are sure once they qualify they will be absorbed in the government service and once they are there they will be taken in different committees of the government where policies are made similarly law 13 law universities are there in the country nalsar in hyderabad is one of the top one which delhi bangalore and hyderabad compete for the first three ranks then national institute of pharmacy education and research nipar idpl of hyderabad is converted 
16 acres, 1600 acres land allotted to this National Institute of Pharmacy and Education Research. There are 18 of them in the country. Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, there are seven of them. Like that, we have identified 300 institutions where at least 5% of our students can get it. So those who are supporting children, meritorious students, try to convince them to get admission to the best of the institution and it will not cost you more than one lakh. Many places, even that is not needed because these children get scholarship and stipend facility. What is needed is to make them aware of this and convince the parents. We are paying that uh, butcher family additional 10,000 per month so that they don't disturb the child. You have to be innovative to do all these things. It won't cost as much. I'm sure 1000 to 1500 dollars for a child who is going to become a policy maker of the country is very minimal investment. What I request is, let us not just go after the civil services. Everybody is worried that we don't have IAS, IPS. There is no doubt we don't have. But the government itself in every university established coaching centers for this program. It happens as per the present system only in the last year when preparation to get into IAS has to start at least five years ahead. Children who are at eighth class or ninth class should understand that they have to take up this and start that preparation from that age. It cannot happen at the final year of graduation or post-graduation. We fail. That's why I'm telling you. We do not have a plan. There is no strategy. Roadmap we do not know. Neither we want to learn. Our main satisfaction is be reactionary. Do short-term things, feel satisfied, go home, sleep. This is happening for the last 70 years. God forbid it may continue like this if we do not change ourselves. There is big awareness about education. Now even poor people wants to send their children to school. We gave scholarships in Hyderabad. I personally look at all the applications. 90-95% applications from very poor people. Children want to study. And we need more money to support. That is the thing. We need more donations, more money because this is the only way. If you don't give opportunity, don't expect results. There's no way. I'll give you one example. I met a girl, actually somebody referred her to me. Third year in engineer, a medical, excellent student. Her father had a stroke. She, he was a bedridden person. And she, only child. Mother used to work as a teacher. She quit because she has to take care of her husband. And they could not pay their rent to the house. They moved into a one-room accommodation which their relatives were free of cost. This girl is walking to college or taking a bus. Right? We heard this and we provided her scholarship, we giving her monthly expenses, we said you study. She has to go only two years. Then she will be done. So many, many cases like this. <coughs> what we have to do is provide the support. And this is what this is all about. You are all right. <coughs> Inshallah. Any any other questions? Are you? Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Akhtar. Um, I just have one quick question um, about uh, how, uh, from the sea point of view, or um, about the youth, for example, in the in Hyderabad. I know a lot of communities uh, are where poor people are at risk. So I just want to know what is our approach. So one is to some sources or to some people you come to know, we come to know, if there is somebody in need or somebody applies for scholarship. But I want to see <coughs> from my example that I am from uh, area of Malakpet, let's say. Or there are many such areas where there are, some, there are a lot of uh, people uneducated. So I have this feeling that um, a groundwork has to be done. So is there any kind of a groundwork or uh, groups or, or kind of a workers 
let's say go, go into these areas and bring awareness. Let's say you go you set up this authority and then go there and then propagate this or tell them we are here to help you if you need something and go to the uh, go to their houses, you know, house by house or or collect somebody, let's say 100, 200 people in the locality, very good locality, and then give some information to them. Here we are to support you. So something like this is happening, or do we have any kind of this approach, or what we can do? Or this is just a suggestion. And one more question, second question I have. Sorry, it's not a lecture. So my second question is, um, I, I still have a feeling, you know, uh, very sad feeling about what I do in Hyderabad. You know, many people go into colleges, uh, universities, also engineering colleges, but their, their youth, their caliber is being wasted. Because they spend time in a lot of other activities, they are not still rising to the challenges of the community. So, we are talking about social, economic and upliftment. So, uh, we should come up with a plan or uh, like, you know, I, I know Professor Saab very well and he has done a lot of things, a uh, lot of support for education. But still, I want to say, like, we have to extend this. How we can go to those youth which are not even caring about education, and they don't care about the challenges like NRC and CA coming to our community, and they don't even know. When I visit to Hyderabad, I, I feel very sorry that people, I see I see group of people wasting their time, youth, and not doing anything, just, you know, chit-chatting. So we should have to look for this youth also, what you can do. And from these people, we can take them to education or put them into some you know, some kind of uh, education and put them into right track. So, just want to ask you what we can, uh, what has been done, or uh, from, from the MESCO and also from the C point of view, uh, what is the approach we are taking on this year? That's the Thank you, <coughs> thank you, Akbar. Regarding this awareness program and volunteers for that, yes, our uh, political party has a very good network. So the priority of the community is if the police comes and detains any of the youth, which leader comes to rescue them from the police station? This is our priority. We are looking from this angle as far as the youth empowerment is concerned. The political party or the religious leadership is not interested in the educational upliftment of the community. No doubt, few of the leaders are definitely working in that direction, which is welcome. But so much more is to be done. It is a task which is very necessary. We try to educate our imams by calling a meeting and telling them that you have the facility of addressing the community 50 times in a year which no political leader or a social leader or anybody else has that advantage. At least out of those 50 khutbas, dedicate 5 khutbas for the education of the community. Their only concern is Dini Talim and Duniyavi Talim. I don't know from where they got they are still stuck to this classification. We run a program to teach Arabic language in English schools so that the children can read, write and understand Quran. To teach that, we thought the best place to get the teacher is from the mother side. That was a mistake we did. Because you can get a good Arabic teacher from anywhere except mother side. These are the realities we are living in. The Hupas know how to recite and memorize. They don't understand. The Alim knows the fiqh. He doesn't know the... Practice. How to apply. Islam. I mean. Once they pass, they either become morning, modern, imam, or they are allowed to establish a madrasa in some remote village. So that the earning starts. When this campaign for CA and R started, I was given the responsibility to speak in different platforms. My appeal for this year, Ramzan Zakat, was not to give any Zakat to mother. I'm, I may be wrong. I am wrong also. But 
this is my humble opinion. Please do this experiment. You will see the change in them. You will see the change in the community. Because 50% of your zakat amount or sabta, whatever you are giving to them goes into the pocket of the people who are collecting. Even if you send it to their office, yeah. they have two counters to collect from one counter, give it to another counter and collect the 50%. Why we are discussing this is to not criticize, to correct, to bring some correction. They are also ours. We are also theirs. Money is belonging to the community. Zakat money is for the community. And it is a money. And what have they done all these 70 years? What improvement did they bring in? for the activity that seed is doing. Thank you. Uh, going to the houses and things like that, people locally can do it, but I can tell you one thing. If somebody is sleeping, you can wake them up. If somebody is dead, you cannot do anything. Our community is dead, believe me. I've been working 10 years, you go and you beg and everything. We do scholarships. We give it in Urdu papers, two times advertisement, three times. Each advertisement costs us 80, 90,000 rupees, right? After the deadline is over, they come. We, say, we don't read newspaper. How can you help these people? It's so difficult. And they are really deserving, but don't read newspaper. And these are some of them are in professional colleges. Not everybody can go and go to the house and knock on the door and say, come, we want to help you. Even if you do, they don't come. They run technical institutes. Young people don't want to come. And they started giving them money. Now they are coming, right? So, I mean, there is no self-initiative. There is no such thing. We are working in very difficult situations. Right? Everybody wants to do good. But if the person does not want to receive the good, what can you do? You cannot do it. Inshallah, we'll continue on and will help us. Yeah. We are not even scratching the surface of the problem. It's so much huge problem. Is that enough now? Thanks. Uh, inshallah, in the interest of time, we will take one last question, then we will conclude the program. Uh, does anyone have any questions? One last one. Speech. I have a point someone, but I'm not going to write that down. Okay. Yeah. More political things. Uh, Since we are streaming, if you come, you can talk. All right. Okay, inshallah. So, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for participating here and joining and listening to the speakers here. I'd also like to thank all the people who are watching it live uh, through live streaming. Jazakallah khair. And I also especially thank uh, Dr. Fakhuddin Saab for coming here all the way here. Even though we could not provide you a bigger stage, bigger audience, Alhamdulillah, this has worked out well uh, in a smaller stage and smaller audience. And on the way, I also have online people watching it live. So, Jawaharlal Khair. Inshallah, so I think that will conclude the program. Aul Bilaim Shaykh Khan Al Rajim, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Wallas Indal Imsan Al Fikhus. Illa Ladina Amanu Wamil Sari Khati Watabasa Bilhaki Watabasa Bissab. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Thank <laughs> you.